The wave machine recharges as El Nino continues to build. I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, October 28th. Storm Surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Be sure and like and subscribe. Ring the bell. You get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. To subscribe, just click the Storm Surf icon down on the lower right-hand side of your screen, and then you'll get those notifications. Also, if you'd like to make a contribution, use the special thanks button down below, the heart with the dollar sign in it. We really appreciate it. And I'd like to take a moment to thank those folks that donated last week. Tim Caston. As always, thank you so much. Kim in California, not once but twice donated. Thank you. Kiels Mac, appreciate it very much. Jason Odom, another ongoing longtime contributor. Thank you. Peter Belden as well. Thanks, Peter. And Elliot Harris, yet another. We really appreciate it. All the contributions from everyone. And with that, let's get to work. And just to let you know, if you're interested in the El Nino portion of the forecast, go about 14, 15 minutes into the presentation. There's actually an index down at the bottom. You can go to the long-term forecast. Then we'll get right into all those details. The first part of this presentation, uh, first 15 minutes, is about surf and surf in the North Pacific specifically. All right. With that, let's go take a look at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean currently. We don't see a whole lot going on. A little bit of a gale trying to get organized here over the date Line. It's forecast to build a little bit. Other than that, a little bit of fetch here pushing off to the north up towards Alaska and of no particular interest. Next up, we'll take a look at current conditions. We're starting in Northern California, the Point, Point Reyes buoy number 029. We're looking at all the energy that's hitting that buoy currently. We see a little bump here. So uh, out here, far left-hand side, 33.3 second period energy, super energetic uh, swell energy. And this graph on the other side goes down to five second period, just pure wind swell. And then these lines represent all the energy that's hitting the buoy in each of the period bands. And we've translated the energy into height in feet. So you can sort of get an idea here. There's one, one, 1, 1.1 1 .1 feet, some sort of swell energy in the 14 to 18 second period band. That's actually Southern Hemi swell, believe it or not, the end of October, and not bad southern hemi swell at that, and then a bump of wind swell here as well. So you take all that, you put it together, uh, primary swell 3.5 feet at 8.7 seconds from 309 degrees, so that's your northwest wind swell, making surf at about 3 feet waist high. And then the secondary swell is the southern hemi swell, 1.8 feet at 16.6 seconds from 198 degrees, also making surf at about 3 feet. Um, and actually, at top spots, it's bigger than that. Then right below that, this is just a graph that shows you projected surf heights, calculated surf heights. It doesn't use any bathymetric enhancement or anything like that. It's just strictly a function of the uh, uh, swell height and swell period to give you a rough idea of what the trend has been for the past couple of days. Then finally, at the bottom of the graph here, here's date and time over here. It's sort of cut off, but here's the primary swell height and period. You see it there. Here's the secondary swell height and period. Here's the significant seas, the combination of all swell energy hitting. This is really for boaters. It gives you a rough idea of what the biggest possible wave you could run into out in the open ocean. Then here's something we do, and this is just sort of a tutorial here. This is a function of the uh, the swell height that's less than five, five seconds or less. It gives you a rough idea how lumpy and bumpy the ocean kind of is. So if it's 1.5 feet, that's not bad. When you get into two feet, it's pretty bad. When it gets up to three feet, it's just a blown out mess. So you can kind of use that as this is a rough index of how clean and wonky the surf is or not. In this case, not too bad. All right, so let's play the same game. We're going to Southern California, Point Loma South Buoy 191. It's off there of San Diego, way far to the south. We're looking at all the energy again, the same sort of profile, some sort of swell there in the... Uh 
uh, 16 second period range and then another bump of that wind swell. Put it all together, primary swell 1.8 feet at 16.6 seconds from 203 degrees. Again, waist high surf, but top spots are uh, probably almost double that. And then secondary swell 3.6 feet at 7.7 sec uh, 7 seconds from 285 degrees. Again, about waist high, but <laughs> probably not even that big. Then we go over to the north shore of Oahu, uh, Waimea Bay Buoy, number 106. We see there is a bump of energy there in the 12, 11 to 12, 10 to 12 second period range, something like that. Primary swell, 3.9 feet, 11.6 seconds from 335 degrees. That puts surf at 4.5 feet, and there's still head high to maybe slightly overhead sets and then some wind swell mixed in three feet at 8.6 seconds from 346 degrees really all sort of jumbled in to be one sort of swell and oh right here chop height okay this pulls out this is the current readings 1.4 feet um that's energy from two to five seconds and which is really not a whole lot and then the significant wave height uh, 5.3 feet at 12.5 seconds. Again, that boater sort of indicator of what's going on. That's all the energy greater than five seconds. All right, so let's go take a look back in time, just sort of see what's happening in the North Pacific. We're going back to uh, Zero Z Wednesday, which is Tuesday night, the 24th of October, over the North Pacific. We had a little bit of a swell that was filtering into Hawaii. Another weak gale tried to develop Thursday night into Friday north of the Hawaiian Islands. I mean, we're talking 12-foot seas or something like that. A little swell from that is hitting the Hawaiian Islands today, making for rideable surf. Now we can also look in the Southern Hemi. We're going back to 12Z on Wednesday the 18th, so that's more than a week ago. A gale developed under New Zealand with 32.6 foot seas. These are the highest seas down here over this entire domain for this one time period. And then they quickly faded from there. Swell from that system is what's hitting California now. Another gale developed under New Zealand on Saturday, the 21st of October, with 31.5 foot seas building to 33.9 feet right there. Uh, this was on Saturday morning a week ago, and then fading from there. Swell from that system has hit the Hawaiian Islands. It hit yesterday on Saturday. That was the 28th, and uh, is continuing today, the 29th, and is bound for the California coast. But after that, you'll see, we'll just roll this out here. Not a whole lot happened. Now, there was this other gale here with 36-foot seas. It's all aimed, you can look at the arrows here, aimed the directional arrows aim mainly at, at Antarctica. So we're not thinking any swell is going to result from that, but that doesn't mean that maybe something could happen. We'll keep our eyes on it, but suspect probably not. And then we get us to current time right now. Nothing else has occurred, and the forecast has nothing in the Southern Hemi moving forward. So that puts our focus clearly on the North Pacific moving forward, as it should be for this time of year. We're starting by looking at jet stream level winds. These are winds that are up about 20,000 feet. They help support the formation of gales when those gales form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a dip in the jet. We sort of see it here. If there is a dip, that creates a counterclockwise flow aloft and down at the ocean surface. That's the hallmark of low pressure. And of course, low pressure, if it's strong enough, generates winds on the ocean surface. Those winds get traction on the ocean surface and generate seas. Seas, as they start radiating away from the fetch area, eventually get groomed out and turn into swell. And swell, when it hits your beach, turns into surf. So it all starts in the jet stream. That's the fuel for building storms. We see a reasonably, in fact, a well-consolidated jet stream flow pushing off Japan on the 30 north latitude attitude line, ridging a little bit over the date line with winds to 150 knots and looking like it wants to fall into a trough, but really the trough is there's nothing there yet. We'll put this into motion, see what happens. Winds continue solid here and flattening out, pushing towards the California coast. I mean, this is really a pretty solid, decent jet stream. There's a little bit of splitting here, but not a whole lot. 
and then we're waiting for some sort of a trough to organize. When we get into Wednesday, the day after Halloween, we see the beginnings of a trough here in the Gulf of Alaska, quickly lifting off to the northeast. And look at this. You see winds here getting ready to plow into northern California and Oregon. Not really so much of a trough, maybe more of a weather producer. Then you see, again, another hint of a trough here as we get into Friday north of Hawaii, getting Way You can literally see the upper atmosphere starting to circulate here as we get into Saturday, the 4th of November, and then pushing towards the Canadian Maritimes as we get into Sunday. Likely gale formation there. We also see this big split over here in the West Pacific, but it looks like it wants to join together again beyond next Sunday, somewhere north of Hawaii, so we'll keep our eye on that. More energy in the jet stream, suggesting that it's recharging after a, a extra tropical storm Bolivon that was last week. Uh, no wonder the North Pacific needs a little bit of a break. That was an amazing run of early season swell. All right, so let's go take a look down at the surface, surface level winds and surface level pressure. We know there's really no clear gales going that we say, at least by looking at the jet stream, but here is a, I'll call it a low pressure system. Not, it does have 35 knot winds, so technically it qualifies as a gale. But And it's supposed to continue move easing off to the east, aiming fetch at Hawaii through Sunday and even decently into Monday morning, and then fading out. You see it, but still circulating in the Gulf of Alaska, even into Wednesday. And then we know there's another traffic trough forecast out here somewhere in the later towards the weekend a little bit of weak low pressure then we get into friday and there we go small gale but a gale nonetheless with 35 40 knot northwest winds some of that energy targeting hawaii more of it targeting the u.s west coast so we get into saturday here we go full-on gale 45 knot winds aimed at the pacific northwest with 30 knot fetch at hawaii and this only one to, you know, maybe seven, eight hundred miles away from Hawaii. And wow, Gale looking pretty good as we get a week out. Now, that's a week from now. I don't trust the GFS model more than about four or five days out, but certainly gives us hope. It seems like the recharge pattern is having the desired effect, and we might have surf for all our Hawaiian and U.S. West Coast. Uh, swell locations as we get late, late next weekend into probably the early part of the week beyond. So there is hope. But finally, we need to see those winds getting traction on the ocean surface. So let's go play that game. This is the significant wave height chart, the effect of winds on the ocean surface. So we see the first little gale. Uh, this would be Monday morning. The plus sign is right there 19 foot seas that isn't a whole lot that doesn't even get you a 13 second period and that continues up oh, there we go 20 foot seas monday morning uh aimed somewhat at hawaii we'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say yeah maybe some 12 and a half second period so this is just eyeballing it pushing towards the hawaiian islands that gale fade, fades up but we know there's another one forecast behind still pretty iffy on the models since it's effectively a week out we start with 27 foot seas 26 foot seas but building and aerial coverage 27 feet again as we get into saturday up to 31 feet 33 feet as we get into early Sunday. Now, all those seas primarily targeting, we'll say, from Oregon northward. California, not so much, but swell still expected to result probably for the entire U.S. West Coast. Sideband swell for the Hawaiian Islands. Things looking good, but again, there's still that X factor with the GFS model just being too far out in the future. We'll give it a couple of days. Watch yourself on the models to see how this evolves. Next up, wind forecast for the Hawaii, uh, for both Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast. Hawaii right there, U.S. West Coast there, San Francisco, uh, Point Conception there, Southern California down there. Today, let's get to, we'll just move this forward to about the current time, a light wind regime along the California coast, uh, tra uh, 
Actually, Santa Ana, light Santa Ana pattern for Southern California, first one of the season. I actually got some questions from someone said, where are the Santa Anas? And sure enough, they're arriving just a bit late. The seasons all seem to be shifted off still by about six weeks. So it's just starting to happen. Light winds for the Hawaiian Islands. We get into Monday, light wind regime for California out of basically the northwest. So it's probably offshore in the morning. And light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Tuesday, same deal for California. California, light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Wednesday, a little bit of a building northwest wind pattern, but not too much. You see the big low there in the Gulf of Alaska and light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Thursday, same deal, really no change. Friday, you see south winds from the new building low getting drawn up over the Hawaiian Islands and still a modest northwest wind flow for California as we get into Saturday. A little bit maybe stronger northwest winds. Uh, light trades return for the Hawaiian Islands. Gale filling the Gulf of Alaska. We'll take that. And then finally on Sunday, a 10, to, we'll say 10 knot northwest wind pattern for exposed north and central California and trades for the Hawaiian Islands. So not too much winds, good opportunity to uh, rebuild water temperatures. It took a little bit of a hit uh, last week from just northwest winds, a couple of days northwest winds. Temps dropped about a degree and a half generally north of Point Conception, but they should rebuild this week. Precipitation potential, California right here, that's what we're mainly looking at. We'll just roll this through. The blue is precipitation. If it's white, it's frozen precipitation. There you go. Cape Mendocino, potential for some showers on Thursday into Thursday evening. That's it. And then you see the focus of most of the final push of rain is really the Pacific Northwest Maybe into Cape Mendocino. We'll see what happens beyond that. But again, this is a week out. Not really believable. And then finally, the temperature forecast for backpackers and those in the Sierra. This is the intersection of the Pacific Crest Trail and Tioga Pass Road in the high country in Yosemite. Okay, this is elevation. That intersection where the road and the PCT meet is at about 8,700 feet right there. So that's the reference, reference point. And these are temperatures at various elevations. At that point, you see temperatures. Where are we? We're into uh, Sunday here. Here. So temperatures theoretically about freezing this morning, maybe 40 degrees, but just looking forward to rather pretty normal routine, no big cold dips. Temperatures, we'll say roughly 45 degrees at that elevation. If you're going higher up at 11,000 feet, you can see it's much colder. At, at basically, the, the red line is the freeze line. So you're at near freezing temperatures. But all in all, for the coming week, a pretty normal and mild pattern. All right, so putting this all together, a surf forecast for Ocean Beach, California, Northern California, surf heights, two and a half feet, something like that, Main, mainly southern hemi swell and little bits of wind swell mixed in, and then a little bump of something as we get into Friday, Saturday, this would be next weekend, okay, that's the surf heights. Let's go look at swell heights. You see, what do we have? This is the southern hemi swell, 1.8 feet at 15 seconds with some of that wind swell all mixed in. That fades out as we get into Tuesday or so, but I know there's another bump of southern hemi swell. It gets kind of mask here. When we go to southern California, you'll, you'll see it hit there. And then we start to see a building... I'll call it a wind swell pattern because the period's only in the 10 to 11 second range and, and uh, swell heights four and a half feet. But you can see that's what's making the surf heights in the, we'll call it the head high range for Friday into the early part of next weekend. We go to Southern California, Dana Point, same sort of deal. Now you see this perpetual like two and a half foot surfs fading some, then bumping up a little bit to two foot. That does not include any bath and bathymetric enhancements. So if you, you know your breaks and you know which spots focus Southern Hemi swells, and then the surf height will of course be higher. But you can see it here. Swell heights 1.6, 1.5 feet and fading in the 15 to 14 second period range. Not next bout of swell comes in one to one and a half feet at 15 seconds sort of thing, dribbling on into the early part of the weekend. And then theoretically, north of Point Conception, there's some minimal swell, but it's probably not going to be enough to really wrap significantly into exposed Southern California breaks. 
And finally, we go to the north shore of Oahu. Here you go right here. The current uh, wind swell on Sunday uh, the, that's hitting, it's just proto swell, whatever you want to call it, four and a half feet. Wave heights actually, just, again, does not include bathymetric enhancement. So surf heights are maybe head high to a foot overhead sort of thing. And then another pulse of swell from a gale that's forecast north of the islands arrives on Wednesday and surf heights a little bit bigger, five and a half feet, and then trickling down from there. Swell heights, you can see it here. What do we got? Four feet at 11 or 12 seconds today, fading to the early part of the week. And then here comes another bout of 4.4 foot swell at 12 seconds, maybe 12 and a half seconds, uh, midday Wednesday and fading down from there. And now for the long-term outlook, the El Nino part of the discussion. Actually, we're going to start with the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, and then the ENSO, El Nino-Southern Oscillation discussion. These two oscillations are the major effectors or influencers of weather over both the North and South Pacific, so we'll dive deep into them. The MJO discussion first, the Manjulian Oscillation. This periodic weather oscillation that orbit, uh, rotates around the planet has two phases, active phase and inactive phase. It rotates around the planet from west to east on the equator with the active phase on one side of the planet, inactive phase on the other. They rotate around the planet. The good phase is the active phase. It's like a low pressure system. The inactive phase is like a high pressure system. The active phase, the low pressure system, when it starts moving over the West Pacific, what it does is it sucks warm, moist energy from down at the ocean surface up into the atmosphere. That gets caught by the jet stream. It, it energizes the jet stream. The jet stream gets stronger, digs out troughs, makes storm, and therefore surf. Also, the active phase of the MJO, when in the West Pacific, it dampens trade winds. Okay, and that's super important. As the active phase moves from west to east across the equator, it dampens the trade winds and, and often can reverse those trade winds. That takes warm water that's in the far west Pacific, starts pushing it to the east, not on the equator, but under the equator in what's known as a Kelvin wave, a ball of warm water. It takes about eh, three to four months for that ball of warm water to traverse the entire width of the Pacific. Eventually, it hits the Galapagos Islands and Ecuador erupts to the surface and creates a warm water slick there. Now, if you have successive active phases of the MJO, and so the, the active phase will take like four to six weeks to make its way across the Pacific, followed by the inactive phase for another four to six weeks. And then theoretically, another active phase can follow behind that. So at six week intervals, let's say. So you, if you have successive active phases of the MJO, they can make successive Kelvin waves, those balls of warm water. And eventually all that warm water starts piling up off of Ecuador. The warm, moist air there will start evaporating up into the atmosphere. That will start tapping the jet stream, changing the jet stream configuration. And that is how you get El Nino. So tracking the active phase of the MJO-1 is super interesting because it gives us a good early lead of knowing when you're going to get into a storm cycle and have a lot of surf. Two, if you have a bunch of active phases of the MJO, that can be an early indicator of the development of El Nino, which is exactly what we have been going through for the past, since last, even late last December. The first uh, active phase of the MJO created a Kelvin wave. We've had six Kelvin waves since then. A uh, seventh one is forming right now, and we think there might even be an eighth one behind that. So all that clear signs of a developing El Nino. All right, so let's get down to reality. What's actually happening now? What's going on with the winds? Remember I said that the active phase can reverse trade winds? So here is the East Pacific here. Here's the West Pacific here, the equator there, the date line right there. That is New Guinea right there in the far West Pacific. We're just looking at the arrows. Trade winds blowing out of the east, sort of more of the southeast. Uh, long arrows, so pretty strong. Same thing over the Central Pacific up to... Somewhere right around in here, right around the date line, and then west of here, trades get much, much weaker. Now, it's not the actual wind speeds that really matter. This bit of can you make a Kelvin wave is all really attributable to are the trades blowing 
not actually reversing direction, but just weaker than normal. If they weaken and stay weak for a while, you'll get warm water sloshing to the east. So they call it anomalies, the difference from normal for this time of year. So we look at the, the arrows here and you see, well, winds look pretty much neutral. Maybe a, a hint out of the west here in the East Pacific, light west. So slightly weaker than normal trades over the Central Pacific and same deal over the West Pacific. So maybe not a full on active phase of the MJO, but trades definitely weaker than normal. And what's been going on for the past five days, this is 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies. Again, is the wind stronger out of the east or stronger out of the west than normal? This is up at 40, 850 millibars, up about 4,700 feet, but a good proxy for what's going on at the surface. Let's look at this chart. South America, Central America, New Guinea there, zero. That's the equator, the date line right there. The oranges and red westerly anomalies, and we're only interested in five degrees north and south of the equator. Yeah, it's hard to believe this tiny little area on the equator, just either side of it, mainly here in the West Pacific. That's what really matters. But we see westerly anomalies on the 23rd of October. Same thing on the 24th, 25th. 26, 27th, and you see westerly anomalies all pushing into Ecuador as well. All that speaks very much of what appears to be a developing El Nino pattern. Pretty typical. All right, what's the forecast for the next week? This is from the GFS model. This is past performance here. This is the forecast down here. Same deal. Oranges and reds are westerly anomalies. The blues, purples, easterly anomalies. But this is the whole planet, not just the Pacific. So we got to whittle it down here. Dateline runs right up the middle. Okay, that's good. That's in the Pacific. Far west Pacific starts about 125 east, so right there. And the Pacific ends at about 80 west, so roughly, uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, not 80. Uh, yeah, 80 west, so right about right there. Okay, but the Kelvin wave generation area, that's what we're primarily interested in. The area where if you get west anomalies, it transports warm water off to the east. So that's right in this area here. So you see today, we have blues, a little bit of easterly anomalies over the Pacific right now. Okay, maybe the inactive phase of the MJL, hard to say, but you see we've had just steady bouts of westerly anomalies pretty much the whole way through October, save for maybe a couple, uh, we'll say a week right here. Now we're into maybe a three-day spurt right here. And then after that, more westerly anomalies forecast. The GFS model more in about a week out here. I don't believe it. I don't believe this easterly anomaly thing down there, but we'll see how that plays out. This model did predict this little burst of easterly anomalies, but a week and a half ago, it said it would last for a week or more, and now it's down to, what, a day or two, maybe three sort of thing. So uh, this model sort of grossly overhypes the, uh, it appears to be overhyping the extent of the easterly anomalies and underhyping the extent of the westerly anomalies, which is a good thing for our purposes. Another component of the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, is sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface, or another way of saying cloud cover. Okay, so this is a prediction for cloud cover. This is from a statistical model, the CA model. South America there, Central America there, Hawaii, New Guinea, equator right there, dateline right there. Oranges suggest positive anomalies, more sunlight bouncing off the ocean surface, cloud-free skies, okay? Um, so this suggests the inactive phase of the MJO building some five days from now and almost strong 10 and 15 days from now. The, G, or the GFS model pretty much saying the same thing. So is this really the inactive phase of the MJO or is it really a different component of El Nino? Okay, and we, I'm not going to get into that right now, but the suspicion is this is not the inactive phase of the MJO. This maybe, maybe, maybe is just related to uh, the development of El Nino. Next up, phase diagrams. The same two models, statistic model, dynamic model. This shows where the center of the active phase of the MJO is on the planet and how strong it is, right? So how do you read this chart? Kind of a weird chart. 
The circle is the strength indicator. If the MJO is near the circle, it's very weak. If it's way out here on the edges, it's strong. And then there's the position. The MJO moves from the Indian Ocean west-east over the Maritime Continent to the West Pacific, to the East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over Africa, then back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot is where the active phase is right now, so over Africa. So on the exact opposite side of the planet from where we want it to be. And then here's the one, two, three different projections, two of them having it very weak in the Indian Ocean. Another projection says, well, maybe building to moderate strength, but still over in the East Indian Ocean. No good for our purposes. The GFS model, totally different picture, says, yeah, it's over Africa, but it's going to meander and into the West Pacific right there, but exceedingly weak two weeks from now. So two vastly divergent views of how this is going to play out. Um, neither one of them are probably right. El Nino is probably trumping whatever these guys think is going on. Upper level model. This is another view of the La Nina, I'm not uh, the active phase of the MJO or inactive phase of the MJO situation. South America, Central America, New Guinea, equator there, dateline going right down. This year are eight panels, five days a panel going out 40 days. The oranges, dry air, one can uh, loosely attribute that to the inactive phase of the MJO. So it looks like inactive phase of the MJO per the statistic model through, I'd say, about 13th of November, and then you see a light wet pattern starting to set up with the active phase coming into play the second half of November. So dry air, inactive phase for the next eh, two weeks or so, and then wet air setting up after that. That's sort of consistent with what the other models say, and then probably doesn't speak to El Nino. We'll keep digging here. All right, so let's go out and look for the next month. This is the CFS model, 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies. This is the whole planet again. So let's see, there's the dateline running right up the middle. Okay, we're really interested in the far west Pacific. So that's that area. It starts at 125 east. So there, in there. Now you can see we've been through this just steady bout of westerly winds. No indication of the active phase of the MJO. See this? Uh, oh, MJO there, the solid contour. That was the last clear, obvious active MJO we saw in August. But that said, oh, there's the a little inactive phase. <laughs> really nothing. But steady westerly wind anomalies have been occurring since pretty much all the month of September. You see that. You get these... Uh, the like an inactive Rossby wave and an active Rossby wave that basically pairs with the El Nino base state and gooses up the westerly wind anomalies, which is what we want to see. We're in sort of one of those negative Rossby wave, equatorial Rossby wave situations right now. So we get a day or two of easterly anomalies and then westerly anomalies return again pretty much the whole way through November. This suggests the inactive phase of the MJO setting up around Thanksgiving. That doesn't make any sense. Also notice westerly anomalies have been over the... Uh, uh, the far east Pacific for almost a month now. They're supposed to abate a little bit and maybe get some easterly anomalies. But in all, this is the main area we're interested. It all looks favorable for El Nino. And also notice massive easterly anomalies. This is over the Indian Ocean. They call this the uh, positive phase of the Indian Ocean dipole. Basically, I think I can just consider it another, another symptom of El Nino. So we have easterly anomalies here over the Indian Ocean, maritime continent, westerly anomalies over the far west Pacific. Why is that? Well, if you have downward falling air and it hits the ocean surface, it splits and goes either direction. This is a part of the Walker circulation. So the Walker circulation, we've talked about this before. We'll get into that a little bit more. There's, there's an upward branch of it and a downward branch of it. And normally the downward branch is, well, it depends if, if it's, um, uh, La Nina, it'll be over the dateline. 
but it shifted over to the maritime continent now. So this is downward falling air over the maritime continent hits and starts blowing. And the downward falling air, I think, is hitting somewhere right around here, 120 east. That's the maritime continent blowing hard east over the Indian Ocean and hard west over the West Pacific. Classic El Nino kind of a setup. So just something to note. So next up, outgoing long wave radiation. This is not a forecast. This is actually what is happening. That's going to play into this longer range forecast. And you've seen this before. So this is cloud cover. The oranges and reds are no clouds. That would mean downward falling air. The blues, upward, upward moving air, warm, warm, moist air going up into the atmosphere. Now this is last year. And this is the dateline right here. The point being, very dry air, upwards, uh, downward falling air last year associated with La Nina with the upward branch of the Walker circulation here, the warm, moist air, lots of cloud cover here all over the maritime continent. Now look where we are down here. It's reversed. The dry air over the maritime continent, the wet air now over the dateline and building strong. This is getting considerably more coherent looking much like this, but now reverse position. This is a classic El Nino kind of sign, exactly what you want to see for a building El Nino situation. Now, I'm not saying super El Nino, I'm just saying El Nino. So you have the upward branch of the walker circulation over the dateline, taking warm, moist air, sucking it up into the atmosphere, the downward branch coming down right here over the uh, maritime continent, and that's real dry air. There is drought over Australia, uh, classic El Nino sort of symptom where we have a building wet pattern over the Pacific. We're not seeing it yet into the U.S. West Coast, but the suspicion is we will as we get deeper into winter. All right, so here's the same thing, outgoing long wave radiation, but this is the forecast and a projection from the CFS model. And you can actually go look at the hindcast here. Here's past performance. Here's the forecast. Now, this model goes out three months, not just one month, but three months. But we still get the same thing. Here's the date line right here. The blues are cl more clouds, building cloud pattern. You can see it steadily building since even September. The forecast, very idealized, but you see... Now we got to go for about a week and a half and then deep cloud cover building and moving off to the east. Classic El Nino sort of thing where you have dry air, which has been steadily building over the maritime continent, continuing into December and then starting to move to east. So this would be the beginnings of the transition, probably the peak of El Nino, but also giving you the indication of, oh, here comes the dry air moving back over the dateline and the wet air at some point is going to start building over the maritime continent. The beginnings of a La Nina, which is pretty typical after El Nino, you transition to La Nina. So I don't want to even talk about it. I don't want to even think about it because we've been through three years of a strong La Nina. So I'm going to just savor the moment, enjoy the El Nino while we have it. Clearly, this suggests that pattern evolving. All right, now we switch to the wind, west wind anomaly pattern, oranges and reds, west anomalies, the blues, east anomalies, dateline right up the middle. You see the west anomaly pattern that's been steadily building. Notice it's sort of sliding off to the east over time. This is back in July. Building, building, and the forecast to only build stronger, especially as we get into November. So this sort of hints that maybe those other models where I, I was trying to sort of say maybe not the inactive phase of the MJO, sort of hints that maybe we are in some sort of a weak inactive phase of the MJO, just looking at the wind data. But that will be out of it pretty quickly, like within a week, and then we're off to the races. Also notice the strong east wind pattern here over the maritime continent, the falling point where the downward branch of the walker circulation pretty much looks like it's somewhere right at the edge of the entry point to the, to the far west Pacific. But then again, that same pattern where it starts moving, the falling point moves to here right on the dateline as we're into the end of January, the peak of El Nino and the beginnings of its collapse. Now let's also overlay the MJO here, the solid contour active phase of the MJO. So we're just coming out of a weak active phase of the MJO. The MJO gets very suppressed during El Nino. El Nino takes over 
Here we go. Inactive phase of the MJO forecast for the next two weeks, destructively interfering with El Nino. What that basically means is it just sort of takes the edge off of El Nino a little bit. And you can see that in the westerly anomalies here. They're forecast weaker than normal. But then the active phase shows up as we get into November. West anomalies build. We're off to the races. Another inactive phase. You get the pattern here. Now, the El Nino La Nina signal right here, the black contour. This is the low pressure bias, the El Nino signal. One, two, three contours centered right over the, well, just a little bit east of the dateline now, maybe 175 west. Fourth contour forecast building in another five days, not even a week. There's the week tick. So building El Nino and a fifth contour as we get into the Christmas time and beyond that. Also notice the center of the axis starting here about 170 east moving to what is that? About one just eyeballing it 150 west. So a point north of Hawaii. Okay, so that is pretty typical of El Nino. This El Nino looks to be peaking out later than most. A lot of them, they peak out in like November, or early December sort of thing. This one looks like it's going to be a mid to late January sort of peak, which is interesting. So we've already had one solid good storm in the North Pacific, but it sort of suggests the center of the peak of real storm and swell production might be more... Uh, Thanksgiving and beyond, really January, February, March sort of thing, um, which is pretty typical of the North Pacific, but enhanced significantly by this El Nino pattern. All right, what's going on? Enough of the MJO thing. What's going on in the ocean now? Subsurface, not at the surface, but down in the ocean. We talked about Kelvin waves before. We talked about the uh, migration of warm water from the, normally in the West Pacific or over to the East Pacific. So this is data from the TAO buoy array series, buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. This is the East Pacific here. This is the West Pacific here. This is depth down in the ocean, 100 meters, 200, 300 meters. These are anchor lines on the buoys, the TAO buoys, the TAO buoy array used for monitoring El Nino. And there are, those X's are actual individual sensors on the anchor lines. They get, they collect water temperature data, subsurface water temperature data, and then use a model to fill in the gaps. And you get a profile of what's going on warm and cold water wise in the Pacific. If it were La Nina, you'd have piles of cold water in the East Pacific and all your warm water would be in the West Pacific. But our warm water has, well, compared to last week, the 30 degree centigrade isotherm line. What is that? It's at 167. I think it was 169 last week. So it's sort of creeping, but pretty much stationary. 29 degree isotherm. It, it's within a degree or two of where it was last week. So no real change. 28 degree isotherm. If anything, it's backed off a little bit, still about where it was last week. And the 24-degree isotherm, solid, no change from last week. All suggesting warm water is moved off to the east, but not as far east and not as strong as it was, say, two or three months ago. Now, that said, it's the anomalies, the difference from normal for this time of year. Clear signal, massive warm signal. This is Kelvin wave six and probably warm water for Kelvin wave number five and four and a bunch of others all backed up off of Ecuador here. Four degree anomalies. I'm tracking the, the, where these positions are almost daily. They've been unchanged for the entire week. So a big pile of warm water, but what really sticks out? Let's go find the dateline here. Dateline 180 west or 180 west right there. This, a new pocket, it was just one degree or two degrees above normal. Now it's three degrees above normal. This is Kelvin wave number seven generated from, if I recall correctly, westerly anomalies back in August and early September. It is on its way. It'll take another two or three months before it merges with this pile of warm water and just adds yet more fuel to the El Nino fire putting the balance of warm water here in the East Pacific, not in the West Pacific, changing the jet stream pattern, dragging things all around, dragging the low pressure bias, which normally is way over here in this direction, all clear signs of a developing El Nino.
And then if you don't want to use the buoys to see what's going on down in the ocean, there's a satellite way to do this, not like it's beaming down and actually recording temperatures. It infers temperature, uh, uh, temperature differences by the height of the ocean surface, the sphere of the ocean. So Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Central America, Hawaii right there, equator there, dateline there, New Guinea there. You're looking at this going, what is, well, these are not five degree temperatures. They are five centimeter above normal anomalies. So what's all this mean? Okay, at its core, the idea is cold water at depth contracts. When it contracts, it's going to create a divot on the ocean surface. When there is warm water at depth, it expands. Warm water expands, it'll create a bump on the ocean surface. So if you see Ecuador and you see zero to five to 10 centimeter anomalies above normal, then you can assume that this whole area, notice five degrees north, five degrees south of the equator, that there's massive amounts of warm water. And that's the dateline there. So from west of the dateline out at 165 east, basically the entire Eastern Pacific has massive amounts of warm water at depth, all waiting to gurgle up to the surface. This is our new Kelvin wave number seven. This is Kelvin waves five, six here, all poised and erupting to the surface. Again, confirming what we saw in the previous chart, but let's dial it in one more level. Here's the real resulting chart of the warm water placement based on the satellite techno technology. Basically saying the same thing. Lots of warm water. What is this? Four and five degree anomalies all here from California's at 120. So from 120 the whole way into Ecuador, that's a lot of warm water. And then here's our newly developed in Kelvin wave with one, two, three, four, five. So one, two, three, four, five, three to four degree above normal temperatures here, which will only get amplified and turn into five to six as they push into this area, as they start lifting up. So, and yet more warm water all behind that, the whole way over the West Pacific. I mean, all, you know, the short of this is, this is a great picture. Lots of warm water, all suggesting clearly an El Nino pattern in play and not going anywhere anytime soon. And then upper ocean heat anomalies for the past year. This really tells a wonderful picture, okay? West Pacific here, East Pacific here. The reds, warm water. The blues, cold water. November last year, cold water all over the East Pacific. Classic El Nino symptom. The cold water supports high pressure above it, supports stronger than normal trades blowing east to west, blowing all the warm water, keeping it sequestered in the far West Pacific. But then... Right around Thanksgiving time, active phase of the MJO created a Kelvin wave and a little bit of warm water seeped off to the east and kind of cut off the cold water. That cuts off the high pressure above it. We got in January another Kelvin wave. Kelvin wave number two erupted and actually created a warm pool off of Ecuador. Kelvin wave number three in March. Kelvin wave number four in April. Kelvin wave number five in May. Massive amounts of warm water building in June off of uh, um, uh, Ecuador. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Kelvin wave number six in July. You see it right there. And now here is Kelvin wave number eight building. But also notice what was all warm water here is now starting to turn cold and building in the far west Pacific. Remember, we have strong west anomalies here, just scraping every bit of warm water, pushing it in this direction. The pendulum is swinging from the west Pacific to the east Pacific, but you know at some point it's going to swing back and we'll end up back in this pattern probably about a year from now. But again, I'm not going to think about that. Sea surface temperatures. All right, we've talked the MJO thing, and that's kind of the mechanism to force all this warm water moving around. We looked subsurface, we looked at the Kelvin waves, and it's just a train of Kelvin waves coming our way and has been the entire year. Hooray! But at the end of the day, what matters is water temperatures on the ocean surface. All right, so uh, South America, Chile, Peru, Ecuador. Central America, Hawaii, the equator in this region, the oranges and reds, warmer than normal temperatures. So what I've been a little concerned with this week is 
right out in here. Yes, very warm. You see these pockets, one, two, three, but not as warm as they were last week. And I kind of got a little despondent about that. But then what I failed to notice was out here a much stronger warming signal building. Why would I care about that? Well, the official El Nino monitoring region goes from 120, so California right there, 120 west out to the date line, or actually 170 west, so here. So it's this area right in here. And what we've had all year is lots of warm water, but it's not even the in the official El Nino monitoring region. They call this the Nino 3.4 region. The Nino 1.2 region is right here. And that's where all the warming has been. But what this suggests is that warm water is now getting caught by lighter than normal trades being dragged off to the west. And we know there's multiple Kelvin waves all forecast to erupt in this area. Also going to, so it's backfilling in here, building a broader, you need a broader, long lasting pool of warm water to really start dragging the jet stream or the, I'm sorry, the upward branch of the Walker circulation to the east towards the East Pacific. That fuels the jet stream. That fuels the storm machine. That makes your surf. That also drags uh, atmospheric rivers into California, producing snow and rain. This is a very good sign, building warm water out here. The trend for the past seven days, sure enough, you can see it right here, just those little blue pockets that's cooling water. But notice building warm water out here from about 130 out to about 160 or 165, confirming what we, I, I looked at in the previous image. And then you see that pattern here as well. Sure, plenty warm here in the Nino 1.2 region, but the building warmth out here in Nino 3.4. In fact, here's the chart. Nino 1.2, the area right there along Ecuador. Sea surface temperatures, they were up at 3 degrees. They're actually higher than that, a little bit higher than that back in, was it June and July? steadily fading as the warm water from this region starts pushing out more towards the central pacific today's value here pull it down plus 1.589 degrees still well above el nino threshold and still quite warm and more warm water building to backfill into this area so this looks good the official el nino uh, monitoring region, the Nino 3.4 region, again, that area south of California out to almost eight, the dateline, up to plus 1.417. Now, this is, again, low. This is about two-tenths of a degree below normal. This is probably really about 1.6 degrees, I'd say. Now, that's just one day, and this is only five days. But uh, and it's warm water over weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks uh, uh, that affect the jet stream. Not a single point for a single day, but the trend clearly is upwards today. You can see the movement of warm water sea surface temperature anomalies to the west here too, okay? This is the entire Pacific Basin, East Pacific here, West Pacific here. Here's that big buildup of super hot temperatures into even September off of Ecuador. Then it moderated, but you also see this, the extent of the temperatures, and what is this? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So one and a half to two degree anomalies slowly inching to 140 and even more. You see this little pocket out here. We're going to talk about that in a second. But you want to get all this to merge in this area. And I think clearly we're on that train. The question is when it'll happen now. Oh, it'll probably be December or January till it all happens. But we are moving in the right direction. Look at here during La Nina all colder than normal temperatures. Now look at it, cooking warm and building, filling the entire equatorial Pacific basin. Pretty sweet. Here are the weekly sea surface temperature anomaly values. This is for the Nino 1.2 region, Nino 3. Here's the one we're interested in, Nino 3.4. Up to 1.6, up to 1.7, fell to 1.5 for a couple weeks. Now we're back up to 1.6. Also notice in Nino 4, temperatures working their way up. So what does this mean? Zero to half a degree above normal is considered neutral. Half a degree to one degree above normal is considered weak El Nino. One degree to one and a half degree above normal is moderate El Nino in this region. So moderate. If you're at one and a half to two degrees above normal, 
you're at strong El Nino. So we've already been tickling into yeah, just barely minimal strong status. And of course, two degrees and above is super El Nino. We're nowhere near that. We're not expecting to get there. We just want to get to a solid strong El Nino. And we think we're heading in that direction. So this is this week's sea surface temperature anomaly situation. I'm going to compare that with last week's. There we go. You see the extent of the uh, warming there and the lack of warming there. And then let's see if I can go back and pull that up. So you can see how it backed off here, but building out. Now let's compare this one to the uh, Super El Nino of 2015. You can see a little bit warmer there, a lot warmer there. And I'll go back and forth between the two of them so you can see them. There is starting to be less and less of a comparison this year's event looking less like 2015 and then we compare to the 20, 2009 el nino same time october 28th you could see we are way ahead of that and that was kind of a big deal the 2009 so we're way beyond that and then finally we try to compare to the super el nino of 97 there we go, center that a little bit better there. Okay, and you see there really is no comparison at all. They just, it's not even close. So then that was super, that was a gold standard El Nino. So we're not in the 97 category. We're not in the 2015 category, but we're definitely stronger than 2009. Um, so we'll see where this all goes. So let's look at the ocean current. The current is affected by winds and wind, and this is gives you a pretty good idea of how much westerly anomalies have been in play over the West Pacific. There's New Guinea there. I think the dateline is right there. Okay, strong westerly currents in the West Pacific. Over in the far East Pacific off of Ecuador here, we have easterly currents. Okay, but you see the westerly current trying to make it the whole way across. The convergence point between the two of them, if I were eyeballing it, probably right about there, that's 170. But then we could do this, we'll add sea surface temperatures. Oh, it's actually right, the center of that's right there, 176 uh, west. So we think that is where the updraft of the Walker circulation is, somewhere between the convergence of the west current, the east current, you get warm water building in between the two of them. I'll go back to the currents there just so you can see it. Somewhere right around there. Upward draft of the Walker circulation, very close to the dateline. The outgoing long wave radiation data also suggested it's somewhere just to the uh, east of the dateline as well. So all this, though, looking very much like El Nino and building day by day. All right, so what's the atmosphere think is going on? We look at the Southern Oscillation Index. Difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, kind of in the Indian Ocean, and Tahiti, clearly in the Pacific. All right, when pressure is lower in Tahiti, as one would expect during a developing El Nino, or at least during the active phase of the MJO, pressure, the readings go negative. Today's value, minus 3.29. That's not very negative. And look the past... Oh, one, two, three, four, five, or six days. It has, it's been neutral to just barely negative. Whereas prior to that, we've been steadily negative, not super negative to minus 23 at one point. I think some of this is speaking to that inactive phase of the MJO that's occurring right now and is going to hold for the next week or so. So we'll see, probably see near neutral uh, daily contributions here. The 30 day average. So this is probably your better uh, active inactive phase of the MJO indicator minus 7.64 we were down to minus 13 at one point minus 13 this is probably during the active phase of the MJO in earlier part of October things moderating a little bit but we expect that to start falling the 90-day average minus 10.81 where were we a month ago minus 9.9 .9. so pretty much steady state El Nino Though we expect any day now, probably not till after the inactive phase fades out, so a week from now, but we expect all these to start to be really moving hard negative in the next month. Here's the 30-day moving SOI graphed out, positive numbers top, 
Negative numbers below, zero right there. This is La Nina when you're all up here in hard positive numbers. The downward spikes are the active phase, the MJ of the upward spikes, the inactive phase. When the inactive phase is stronger than the active phase over time, you get La Nina. When the active phase is stronger than the inactive phase, look at that giant drop in April. Uh, what was that? From January the whole way into uh, June. Then we went up a little bit. Now we're just sort of toggling around. We're waiting for the machine to really just start supercharging into El Nino territory. We know it's coming. Uh, it's a slow moving boat. It takes a long time to turn, but we see that that is going to happen, or at least we're reasonably confident. And probably in a couple of weeks, we're going to see a steady downward move of this after the inactive phase of the MJO moves out. But all right now, still in El Nino territory and expected to only build over time. Sea surface temperature anomaly forecast from the CFS model for the official El Nino monitoring region, the Nino 3.4 region. All right, we are in, what are we? End of October, somewhere right around here. This is the middle of the month. Temperature is supposed to hold right at bare minimum threshold for strong El Nino into about mid-November and then heading upward from there, peaking at 1.9 or 1.95 degrees for what a week maybe in january probably averaged out over three months somewhere in the i don't know 1.75 range that's the, you know you need three consecutive overlapping months to, to uh, sort of officially get where the peak of the el nino is going to be eyeballing it i'm saying 1.7 degrees something like that if you have a different thought write it up in the comments section then after that the clear shift towards well, neutral and probably La Nina beyond. Now, that is the more optimistic view. The PDF corrected version is sort of the conservative version from the CFS model. It says temperatures falling to 1.4 degrees in November and then up into about the 1.6 to 1.65 range and then dropping from there. So anywhere from 1.6 to... 1.9, but then you got to do it over three months. But either way, uh, all suggesting an El Nino pattern in the uh, strong, mid, mid strong range. Uh, last week, we looked at the comparative analysis. You can go look at last week's video of all the models. They're all saying basically the same thing. A Strong, a moderate strong El Nino, not super El Nino, but moderate strong El Nino uh, developing over the coming months, peaking in mid January. Normally it peaks in like the uh, November, December ish thing. So uh, a little bit later than normal. We saw that when we had a stall back in July, June sort of time frame, we were fretting. Now, we think it's just delayed. Either way, it's still El Nino and still going to get us what we need. All right, we covered a lot of data. Let's just put it into quick bullet points. Developments. Clouds are building near the dateline. Much stronger now than what they have been the past couple of weeks. All evidence of the uh, upflow of the Walker circulation at jet stream level. Exactly what we want to see for building El Nino. Equatorial currents continue to suggest Walker circulation effects at the surface and the upward draft pretty much at the same point where the outgoing long wave radiation was. The North Pacific jet stream, just at a surf production standpoint, is recharging, but the models suggest we might have a storm here about a week out, mainly focused on the U.S. West Coast, but Hawaii will get some of that. Uh, the SOI is negative for the moment, not as strong as we'd like it. We think it's heading down. Inactive phase of the MJO probably uh, affecting it a little bit. But the west wind anomalies are building in consistency and duration over the Kelvin wave generation areas they have since uh, July 15th, and they're forecast to build more. Kelvin wave number six in a series is erupting in the East Pacific. Kelvin wave number seven is building actually stronger than we thought with uh, uh, three degree anomalies now out towards the dateline. This is a very good sign. Active MJO number eight is coming and maybe we'll get another Kelvin wave from that. I think after that, the West Pacific warm pool will be totally tapped out. And all the ENSO models suggest more of the same moving forward uh, with, if anything, the CFS model and its sea surface temperature anomaly forecast, maybe a little bit on the low side. 
So we're projecting the Walker circulation is, of course, going to continue to build towards an El Nino or a stronger El Nino signal. The west wind anomaly pattern is going to continue over the Kelvin wave generation area. At least one more active MJO and our Kelvin wave number eight forecast. Ocean and atmospheric coupling, it's happening right now. We're not even worried about that anymore. It's just how coupled is it going to get and how strong is it going to be and when's that peak going to be? And then the peak ONI, that's the water temperature projection and a bunch of other data, 1.7 to 1.8 degrees above normal. In solid, strong El Nino status category, I don't know. If you got a different thought, uh, and Warren of Warren's movie <laughs> collection, I know you have your opinions. Let's hear about it. All right. All right. So the good news is we don't have any surf at the moment, though we actually have Southern Hemi surf, small as it might be, occurring right now. So you can go get some waves and more of it scheduled uh, about midweek in California. Um, a gale forecast, maybe to make a little bit of surf for Hawaii midweek. But beyond that, a stronger gale, what we'd expect more of a developing El Nino pattern setting up. Uh, a week from now, if you believe the the CFS model, and my guess is after that, there's probably a bunch more coming behind that. So uh, surf is on the way. We didn't even really talk about snow, but uh, there had uh, four inches of snow this week occurred up in the lower Sierra, like in the uh, Tahoe region. It's sticking to the ground. Temperatures looking to not get particularly warm. Uh, the expectation is more of that is on the way. It's just a matter of time. It's still early in the season. We've had uh, two-thirds of an inch of rain here in the Bay Area already. That is good. Tamping down fire danger as we start moving deeper into a classic El Nino fuel fall pattern. This is exactly the words I've been wanting to say for a very long time, and it looks like we're moving in the right direction. All right. If you enjoyed the video, be sure and give us a thumbs up. We appreciate it. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Just click the Storm Surf icon down in the lower right-hand corner and uh, join the party. Um, if you would like to make a contribution, you can just hit the special thanks button, the heart with the dollar sign in it. And other than that, comments, questions, concerns, write them up. We try to respond really quick. We've covered a lot of deep information, and I know it's not easy to understand. So we're here to help educate, and we don't judge by questions that may not seem quite correct. Write them up. We'll answer them. If you're thinking it, 10 other people are too. And with that, we are done for this week. We will do it again next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks for watching and go get some surf.